speech and writing are unique aspects of human activity that allow us to perceive the world around us, gain knowledge and experience, and pass it on to future generations. Speech, as the primary way of conveying the mind, develops during ontogenesis to become the primary mechanism of human thinking. As Ivan Pavlov said, if our sensations and perceptions of the surrounding world are the first signals of reality for us, specific signals, then speech is the second signals, the signals of signals. They are an abstraction from reality that allows for a generalization, which is our superfluous, especially human higher order thinking, resulting first in universal empirism and then in science, a tool for the supreme orientation of a human being in the surrounding environment and himself. The system of speech signals consists of spoken, auditory, invisible signals that are grouped into words and phrases. How do we derive meaning from spoken or written speech? What are neurophysiological processes our brain performs to analyze and interpret the meaning of words and sentences? When does a person become aware of a spelling or a grammatical error? We will discuss these questions during the lecture devoted to the event-related brain potentials N400 and P600. Let us begin the lecture with an overview of the main speech areas which most people have in left hemisphere of the brain cortex. Much of what we know about these areas stems from research on aphasia, a partial or complete loss of language skills caused by brain injury. In the 19th century, French neurologist Paul Broca and German neurologist and psychiatrist Karl Wernicke described two speech areas that were named after them. One of them is Broca's area, located in the frontal lobe cortex, near the motor regions. The cortical area is responsible for the movements of the lips, tongue, and larynx, that is, those muscles that are involved in articulation when speaking. Damage to Broca's area results in loss of expressive speech and speaking ability but do not affect comprehension of speech. The second area is called Wernicke's area and it's situated near the auditory sensory cortex in the temporal region. Thus, when we hear speech, signals from the auditory organs enter the auditory cortex, but the sounds are not recognized as meaningful words until they are processed in Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area is the sensory center of speech, responsible for comprehending what we hear. The perception of written text is handled by another area called the angular gyrus, which is located at the intersection of the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes. It gets information from areas linked with visual processing and ensures that we grasp what we are reading. All of these areas are interconnected, and processing can occur in numerous parallel pathways, creating a link between the discrete functions related to speech activity. Even though all of these centers are in the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere participates in speech function as well. It perceives sounds more subtly and can analyze intonation and imagery of speech. Speech centers may be found in the right hemisphere of people using languages where characters are used to represent complete words rather than individual letters. This is the case with Japanese and Chinese, for example. Let us now examine the major steps of speech information processing. The basic properties of speech signal itself are analyzed in the first 100-150 milliseconds after the introduction of a verbal signal. When hearing oral speech, phonemes are identified and differentiated from background noise. When perceiving written speech, there is a low-level analysis of the lines of curves that can make up letters. At this point, the brain can distinguish between a whole indivisible object 
and the compound elements that could potentially make up a word. The search for word forms comes next. At this point, the brain can distinguish between alphabetic and non-alphabetic signals. Then, semantic analysis is performed, during which the meaning of the provided words is processed. And finally, syntactic and grammatical analysis of sentences or word combinations takes place. Each stage of verbal information processing is accompanied by a change in brain electrical activity, which we can detect using the evoked potentials method. To do this, verbal stimuli should be presented to a volunteer. They could be auditory, provided via headphones, or visual, shown on the screen. We could present single words, word combinations, word series, or entire phrases. The trigger point for evoked potentials averaging will be the moment of presentation of each word or a specific target word of interest for the researcher. In the result of the averaging, we will get electrical responses with multiple components. Their characteristics may differ depending on the modality, whether auditory or visual, and they will also reflect different stages of speech information processing. The earliest stages will take place in the first 200 to 150 milliseconds, but more complex analysis, including semantic and syntactic processing of the presented information, will unfold from 250 milliseconds after the word is presented and onwards. The N400 component is a neurophysiological marker for semantic processing that emerges between 250 and 500 milliseconds and presents a negative shift that peaks at 400 milliseconds. The amplitude of this component is especially large when the provided word does not match the meaning of the previously presented words in the phrase, that is, does not match the context. Or when we use an uncommon word, or when we give the participant a non-word that has no actual lexical status, but sounds or looks a lot like the real word, for example, haswand or library. N400 is also responsive to the lexical properties of words. For example, a random set of letters, as opposed to orthographically acceptable and pronounceable non-words, does not result in N400. A fairly common experimental task is the priming paradigm in which N400 is registered. In such tasks, participants are given a list of words in which the primary word is related to the target word, either associatively, such as bee and honey, or semantically, such as sugar and honey, or the words are direct repetitions of each other, honey and honey. Semantic priming causes the amplitude of N400 to decrease in direct repetition. Thus, by modifying several linguistic properties, it is possible to determine whether the words are cognates. The more cognate their relationship is, the smaller the N400 amplitude will be. When reading or listening to full sentences, the previous context makes it much easier to process the following words, and the brain recognizes the expected words more quickly. Let's take a look at a specific example. The participant is given a sentence in which the target word is the very last word. They wanted to make the hotel look more like a tropical resort, so along the driveway they planted rows of... As shown on the slide, this sentence can be completed in different ways. In the context of the sentence, the participant's most expected word would be palm trees. This word would cause a slight negative shift in the potential. If instead a word from the same semantic category but less expected, pines, is provided, N400 becomes considerably more pronounced. If we introduce a completely unexpected word from another semantic category, tulips, the amplitude of N400 will be maximum. Thus, N400 is a neurophysiological indicator of the degree of semantic integration complexity. The less expected the introduced word is in a given sentence context, the more complex is the semantic integration, and greater is the N400 amplitude. 
The processes associated with syntactic analysis are represented by the event-related potentials letter component, P600. This component is a gradual positive wave shift that occurs about 500 milliseconds after the stimulus is given and lasts for several hundred milliseconds. Its peak amplitude is usually observed in the range of 600 milliseconds. Although it's quite common for this component to appear as a shift without a clear peak. P600 can be observed when there are grammatical errors in the construction of a phrase. For example, when the subject is not in agreement with the predicate, or when a pronoun is in the wrong case, or when the word order in a word combination is incorrect. Unlike N400, which we mentioned earlier, P600 does not usually respond to semantic deviations. It manifests specifically as a reaction to morphosyntactic language abnormalities. It should be highlighted that all of the N400 and P600 phenomena can be detected when the participant has a sufficient command of the language used as a stimulus material. So, if you have a James Bond who denies everything, even knowing English, you can easily check this by using different paradigms to register N400 and P600. If the test participant knows the language, you will get a well-defined N400, P600 or both in different tasks. But, if your participant does not speak the language, then the presentation of target words in a language unfamiliar to him will most likely result in the appearance of the P3A subcomponent, which will be a reaction to a new unexpected stimulus. Now let's talk about the topography and generation sources of P600 and N400. The topography of N400 is influenced to some extent by the modality of the given stimuli. In the case of visually displayed words, the largest amplitude of N400 is observed in the parietal central leads, in the case of auditory word presentation in the central leads. There are also some differences based on whether the words provided to the participant are specific or abstract. The topographic distribution of P600 is relatively broad across the scalp, with this component's peak frequently occurring in the posterior leads. Unfortunately, we could not precisely identify the generating sources using the topographic distribution of N400 and P600 on the scalp. It's preferable to use technologies with higher spatial resolution for this purpose, such as functional magnetic resonance imaging. Using such methods, it was possible to demonstrate that the left temporal lobe is one of the sources of N400 generation, which is directly tied to semantic processing. The right temporal lobe also contributes to the generation of N400, but to a lesser extent. Another source of N400 component generation is located in the left hemisphere in the inferior frontal cortex. This source is not sensitive to semantic search per se, but it may be involved in context-dependent response selection. The sources of P600 generation are located in the temporal and frontal lobes of the left hemisphere. Syntactic processing revealed activation of the anterior parts of the superior temporal gyrus and posterior parts of the inferior frontal gyrus, including the Broca's area. Thus, the physiological basis of speech perception is a broadly distributed neuronal network that upon receiving verbal information instantly initiates signal analysis along two parallel routes. One of these routes is associated with semantic analysis and the formation of links between sentence components. Another way of processing takes into account numerous linguistic rules and principles that are characteristic of each language. Simultaneously with the processing of speech signals, they are compared with those concepts that are stored in short-term and long-term memory. Various paradigms and methods of N400 and P600 are used in experimental psycholinguistics 
because they allow for extensive examination of various linguistic phenomena. The method can also be utilized in the treatment of speech disorders, such as in neuropsychology when working with children who have general speech impairment or dyslexia, or when examining adult patients who have various varieties of aphasia. For example, when semantically unsuitable target words are provided for patients with post-stroke aphasia with damage to the left temporal lobe, the decrease of amplitude and time delay of N400 could be observed. In this instance, N400 monitoring can be utilized to track the recovery of speech capabilities throughout rehabilitation period. The possibility to provide verbal stimuli without an additional task other than passive listening may be crucial in the case of those who do not understand or cannot follow further instructions. For example, when working with young children, patients with cognitive disability, or patients with impaired consciousness. The method can be used to treat coma patients. It can be used to test the semantic comprehension of addressed speech, and this information can be used for further forecast and management of the patient. It should be noted that in every clinical investigation, the age of the subject must be considered, and appropriate normative groups must be chosen. Certain changes occur in N400 and P600 in Alzheimer's disease, a condition characterized by memory impairment. The components are less sensitive to word repetition in this case. Whereas in normal subjects, repeated presentation causes a drop in N400 amplitude due to semantic priming, this effect is reduced or absent in Alzheimer's disease patients. These changes increase with the disease's progress. As a sign of schizophrenia, patients may experience disorganized, incoherent speech. So N400 and P600 may be used to identify patients at high risk of schizophrenia development. When presented with a couple of words or simple sentences, patients with schizophrenia do quite well. However, using more complex sentences or words with various meanings causes unusual changes in the N400 and P600 components. For example, when presented with the sentence, the toast was sincere, patients with schizophrenia show an abnormally high N400 at the occurrence of the word sincere because they interpret the word toast as a piece of bread rather than toast as after dinner speech. Schizophrenic patients are unable to use contacts to resolve the ambiguity of such words. Patients' P600 amplitude may decrease as the sentence grows more complex. They can assess adjacent words next to one another, but cannot conduct entire sentence analysis at a higher level. It should be highlighted that potentials like N400 and P600 can arise in response to any meaningful but non-linguistic stimulus, such as drawings, photographs, or math problems. These potentials display the same patterns connected to the context, structure, and construction rules of the provided content. However, their topography may differ from what we see while analyzing speech information. The verbal and nonverbal components of N400 and P600 are likely related to general conceptual knowledge maintained in long-term memory. Specifically, it refers to how various objects, activities and events in our environment are connected. The software allows you to register N400 and P600 using two types of stimulation, visual and auditory. These tests can be found in the event-related potentials NeuroVisor module. When we open the list of scenarios, the test options with visual stimulation appear at the top. They are called VN400 and VP600. 
In these tests, the test participant will see sentences on the screen that are divided in two parts. The sections are shown after a brief pause. The last word would be the target word. The participant's task is to read the text carefully and rapidly, and after the last word arrives, to press one of the two buttons on the remote control. The button choice is determined by whether the target word is grammatically correct, fits the meaning, or is incorrect. Each participant's reaction is evaluated separately. Today, we will use the auditory versions of the N400 and P600 tests. Let's start by adding them to our favorites by clicking the button on the left and they'll pop up at the top of the list. During these tests, the subject will be presented with stimuli via headphones. Half of these stimuli will be correct, meaning that the target words fit the meaning, and the other half will be incorrect. Let's look at the settings and then go to the Calculation tab. We must ensure here that the analysis epoch used for averaging includes 200 milliseconds before the stimulus presentation. These 200 milliseconds will be used to correct the baseline and 1000 milliseconds after the stimulus presentation, which will include the speech information processing. We will also add a random stimulus delay of 500 milliseconds. Firstly, the random delay will allow us to distinguish one sample from another and one sentence from another, and secondly, it will allow us to avoid the participant's reflex reaction to time. The default setting in the Setup tab is a monopolar montage for 9 electrodes. This is the minimum of electrodes that can be used while registering N400 and P600. Today we'll use a montage with more electrodes, with 19 electrodes. It's also monopolar montage with reference ear clip electrodes. We'll be focusing on the bandwidth in the filter step. The point is that N400 and P600 are modest and protracted wave shifts, and we mustn't alter their form and amplitude. To avoid it, in the drop-down menu for high-pass filter settings, we'll select 0.1 Hz. It is maximal allowable filter rate, and it's possible only to set this value lower. We'll leave the low-pass filter value at 30 Hz which is the default value. In addition, we go to the tab with other settings to adjust the loudness of the supplied sounds. It is preferable to begin the test with lower values and then find the best one for the subject. Let us also consider the settings of the button that our participant will press. If we're gonna run an active test version, and the appearance of the target word should be confirmed by pressing one of the remote control buttons, we must pick the word NO, do not ignore pressing, in the settings. If we want to use the passive version of the test, where the provided sentences are merely to be listened to and no button presses are necessary, then we should set the value to YES. These presses will be ignored. After configuring the settings, we can go to the start window of the selected scenario. The selected montage is displayed on the screen. Its name appears at the top of the screen. As we can see, we'll need one ground electrode, two ear clip electrodes, and 19 electrodes placed over electrically active areas of the brain. Their names and locations adhere to the 10-20% international system. Since we have already discussed in detail how electrodes should be set up to record electroencephalogram and event-related potentials, today we will briefly review the basic steps only. We begin by selecting a textile helmet. It needs to be the proper size. We place it on the participant's head and secure the chin rest. The hair is then cleared away from the areas where the electrodes will be installed. We treat the skin surface with alcohol 
and then use an abrasive scrub to reduce resistance. Special attention should be paid to the ground electrode, as the quality of registration in all other leads is dependent on how it is set up. We add electrically conductive gel using a syringe to squeeze the gel inside the fixation rings. Then we set up point silver chloride electrodes and connect them to the amplifier. We place the participant in a comfortable position. It's critical to make the person comfortable so that the contribution of myographic artifacts is greatly decreased. We carefully put on the headphones so as not to move the electrodes and check the accuracy of electrode placement in the program. If we have good contact and resistance under the electrodes is minimal, all electrodes should be in the green zone. After we've set the electrodes, we'll go to registration by clicking next. We'll start our experiment by registering the N400 potential. The stimuli will be delivered via headphones. In this scenario, we'll use the passive version of the test, which does not require any button pressing when the target word appears. First, we'll begin with the training, presenting five simple sentences, each of which will be separated in two parts, the main body of the sentence and a target word that will either match or not match the meaning. Some dogs have wings. Some books have pages. Some people have brothers. On the screen, there are two marks for each sentence. The first marks the beginning of the main part of the sentence, and the second, the appearance of the last word of the sentence, the target word. Because we are using the passive version of the test and the subject will not be pressing the button, we must confirm this in the warning window before proceeding to the main part of the experiment. Some people have airplanes. Some televisions have pants. Some turtles have elevators. The presentation of sentences in which the final word fits or does not fit the meaning is done at random with equal probability. The averaging trigger point is the target word that comes last in the sentence. The averaging is done separately for words that match the meaning and fit into the context of the sentence and separately for words that do not match the meaning. When we switch to the averaged responses mode, we can see how many averages have already been gathered for each of the stimuli, the target words. These are classified here into correct stimulus and incorrect stimulus. The number of presentations and averages obtained are shown as numbers. These values are displayed for each lead. We can now see the creation of a sensory response in CZ lead in response to the presentation of auditory stimuli. Later on, a negative deviation appears, representing N400 component, and we will need at least 40 averages to detect it. So, we can now run our experiment until we have the necessary number of averages, at which point we can stop presenting the stimuli. The appearance of the target word on the provided averaged curves corresponds to the zero point. The interval of 200 milliseconds preceding the presentation of the target word is used to adjust the baseline in each lead. Now we can see how well the obtained averaged responses begin to diverge in the time range corresponding to N400. This component is particularly visible at the central line in leads PZ and CZ. The amplitude of this component is substantially higher in the case of words that do not fit the context or the meaning. Some books have 
windows. Some buildings have elevators. Some people have parents. It should be noted that we have adjusted the high pass filter to 0.1 Hz. Thus, there may be quite a lot of slow wave oscillations in our recording when we look at the native EEG. However, this is an essential step since we need to record N400, which is quite slow, and we should not diminish its amplitude by using filters. So we have gained the necessary number of epochs for averaging and detecting N400. We can stop our experiment by clicking the time button. Now let's switch to the settings menu and change the language. The presentation of sentences will now be done in the language that our participant does not understand. We'll begin with a regular training session in which five sentences will be presented. We use the passive version of the test with word listening, just as we did in the first experiment. So once again, we have to confirm that there will be no button pressing. Let's move on to the main part of the experiment. To complete our experiment, we must click the clock button at the bottom of the screen on the right hand side and finish presenting the sentences. At the end of our experiment, we'll ask the participant to take the AP600 test, which is the auditory equivalent of the P600 paradigm. Now through the headphones, we'll present a pair of subject predicate statements that will be either in agreement with each other or not. And unlike previous experiments, we'll now use the active test version. We'll ask our participant to press the buttons. They will be different depending on whether the sentence is correct, in agreement or not. The water is boiling. Now, after a remark corresponding to the target word in the sentence, an additional mark will appear corresponding to pressing the button. If everything is in order and our test participant has mastered the training session, we can proceed to the main stage of the experiment. The sun shines. The policeman was looking. The button press time is recorded and displayed in the PDF report. There is also a bar chart with the distribution of response times and an indication of correct and incorrect erroneous presses. The ballerina was dancing. When we switch to averaged responses, we can see how many epochs have been averaged. We can also see that a positive slow waveform relatively late after the target word appears. It may not have a clearly defined peak, and we can see that it develops far later than the sensory auditory response. This wave shows a higher positive deviation in several leads when an incorrect stimulus is presented, that is, the sentence is not in agreement which is typical of the potential associated with grammatical processing and the detection of syntactic mistakes. The water is boiling. The chef were cooked. 
We can finish the study without waiting for the default number of presentations after we have obtained the required number of averages. We have completed the registration of event-related potentials and will now proceed to the data processing and analysis. Let us begin with the results of the auditory test for N400 registration. In this test, the participant was presented with the sentences in the language she was familiar with. It should be noted that the recording we acquired has a variety of artifacts, including electrocardiographic artifacts. There are also pulse waves, which can make it difficult to identify event-related potentials. To remove these artifacts from our recording, we can apply the independent components method, which will allow us to remove these artifacts and get much better result. We can see a variety of different components in the rightmost section of the screen, one of them corresponding to the electrocardiogram. We can remove this artifact from the recording by clicking on the checkbox. For a comparison, here is the raw recording and the one after correction. The second component that we will also remove is the pulse waves that regularly occur in our EEG record. If we select this component, it is excluded from the EEG. And so now we can proceed with the analysis. After removing artifacts, we can average the potentials. Here is the raw recording with the notice about the number of components we removed. Now, by clicking the button at the top, we can select the mode of averaged potentials and depending on what the word was, whether it matched the meaning or not, we'll get two different potentials because the epochs will be averaged independently. They will be marked with the respective colors as seen throughout the registration process. And now, after having examined all 19 leads, we can see that following the generation of the auditory sensory response, a slow negative deviation begins to occur, which is more pronounced in the case of words that do not match the meaning. This is N400, which we can see both along the central line and in the left hemisphere. Now we'll zoom in one of the leads, say CZ, to see how this component is built. It begins to take shape somewhat after the N400 reference point. We can observe that negativity is just starting to build, which lasts quite a long time, covering 400 to 600 milliseconds. We can change our reference point by moving it, clicking on it with the left mouse button and dragging it on the component we require. We can also examine the topography of this component. If we double click on the corresponding latency, we get the amplitude distribution map of this component. It's clear that this component is negative, more pronounced in the case of words that do not match the meaning. We can export the obtained data and use it to compare the results of different experiments. To do so, click the button in the upper right corner of the screen, select Export Data and save it in Excel format. In addition to the Excel file with the amplitude waves, we'll also get the source file in EDF format. The file containing the averaged potentials values can be found here. Let us open it and see that it represents a collection of tabs, each of which is called after the lead for which the averaged responses are obtained. And now we will go to the CZ lead, where we analyzed our potentials, and we'll see that there are three columns of figures. The first column is the time scale, 
This is the epoch of analysis that we used, 200 milliseconds before the introduction of the target word, and 1000 milliseconds during which all of the required components developed. Then, in the second column under number 1, we see the change in amplitude in the average response when the correct stimulus is provided, and in the third column under number 2, we see the amplitude value for the incorrect stimulus, that is the stimulus that does not fit the meaning. These amplitude values can be used to compare potentials obtained in varied experimental conditions. Let us now examine the results of the second experiment, in which we provided the participant with sentences in Chinese, a language she was unfamiliar with. We can now view the EEG which has had the same components removed as before. Switching to the averaged response mode reveals that in the case of the presentation of target words matching and not matching in meaning, there are absolutely identical responses generated. They are sensory auditory responses and there are no event related potentials. When we zoom in on the same CZ lead, we can observe the components of the auditory evoked potential. They are relatively long in duration since the stimuli provided differed. They were delivered in both male and female voices. As a result, the sensory response could be slightly different and we had to increase the number of stimuli provided. As a result, the number of averaged epochs in this experiment is substantially higher than in the first. However, we need to know that, except for the components of the auditory EP, we do not see the N400 component. After the sensory response ends, we observe fluctuations in the noise level. We can also export our data to combine it with the results of the first experiment. We can process the exported data in any program, compare them and present the data for a report. In this slide, we replicated the results seen in the PSS Neurovisor program by combining the two potentials acquired by averaging epochs on target words that are semantically congruent and incongruent in the context of a sentence. This is CZ lead that we previously addressed. It is evident that N400 takes place when semantically incongruent words are provided and its topography is typical for this component. As previously stated, it appears when words in the language known to the participant are provided. The display of words in the foreign language unfamiliar to the participant does not result in the appearance of N400. In this case, there is only the sensory response, the auditory evoked potential, which is completely the same whether the target words are semantically congruent or incongruent. And we don't see any N400 component. Let us now look at the results of the third experiment, in which we registered the P600 potential. In this test, we provided the participant with statements in a familiar language that were either grammatically correct or incorrect, and unlike prior tests, it was necessary to evaluate the correctness of the sentences each time by pressing a button. So we have a mark in the recording that represents pressing the appropriate button on the remote control. And we can tell what kind of sentence it was. If the subjects and predicates disagreed, it was marked in orange. If they agreed, it was marked in green. As in previous examples, we pre-processed this recording and used the independent component method to remove the same artifacts as before. The gray writing on top of the EEG notifies us about it. Let us now switch to the averaged response mode. We can observe the auditory evoked potentials as we did previously because we also presented the sentence via headphones. However, in addition to the auditory evoked response, which is quite apparent in CZ lead and surrounding leads, 
we can see that after the auditory response, a gradual positive wave shift starts to appear. It develops later than N400 that we discussed earlier. It lasts for a long time. If we zoom in on this response, we can see that the maximum of this component is not well defined. It does not have a pronounced peak. However, if we look at this lead potentials, it's just about 800 milliseconds. This is P600, which is the component that occurs when sentences contain grammatical mistakes. Now let's examine the component's topographic distribution. We need to shift our reference point to the corresponding peak. And if we map it out, we can see that it's positive. It's located in the posterior leads and the shift is significantly more pronounced in grammatically incorrect sentences. The resulting data can be exported and shown in another format. This will allow us to analyze the data from this experiment, but also compare it to the outcomes of previous studies. As seen on the slide, N400 and P600 potentials occur in different contexts and correspond to different levels of verbal information processing. To sum it up, in this lecture we learned about the two components of event-related potentials, N400 and P600. We discovered that these components are related to the analysis of language information, with its semantic and syntactic processing. We also discussed the prospective applications of these potentials in psychophysiological and clinical research.